Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this week's PMI Friday webinar, Everyday Tools for Daily Process Management with Barry Byrne. My name is Susanna Clark, and I'm going to be facilitating the session today. Um, it's a first for Barry and I. We've been running these webinars for nearly a year, and so who knows what's in store for you. <laughs> <laughs> I will be running the Q&A desk, and we'll be using that throughout the presentation today, so you can find the Q&A and the chat buttons on your Zoom control panel. Please do keep, keep, keep your questions coming. Um, any comments you have, any observations, I'll put them to Barry. Uh, Barry does like to chat and likes to hear what you've got to say, so please do get involved. Today's webinar is being recorded and we'll send you a link via email early next week to the full recording. That will have both the audio and also the presentation that you're going to see today. As usual, we're also broadcasting live on Facebook and on LinkedIn. So to those of you who are joining us on those live streams, we welcome you. To be able to participate in polls or receive the recording via email or make any suggestions for future topics, please do register at pmi.co.uk forward slash webinars. Barry, can I check something with you? Can you hear yes, me please. twice? Uh, now I can just hear you once, Suze. Well, that's good for everybody. I can hear me twice, very disconcerting. I just thought I'd check. Um, so we will be sending everyone who's registered for uh, the webinar today a short voice of the customer survey at the end of the session. We're really grateful if you can complete this, give us your feedback and all suggestions that you may have for future topics for our Friday webinars. Uh, finally, from me, before we get underway, We've been running these webinars every week to support our clients and our fellow industry practitioners in these difficult times. And we're very conscious that some people are not currently in work. We're offering our support in the form of a free CV or profile review service. So if you are looking for a new role, please do free, feel free to email that to us at team at pmi.co.uk. We'd be delighted to give you feedback on opportunities to enhance it. Thank you all for your continued support. And now I'd like to hand over to Barry. So thank you uh, very much. And I have to say, if I was listening to you twice, it would be twice as good. So thank you for that. It's really good to be with you. Thanks. Um, I, I, and I clearly love it for you to be my, uh, for me to be working with you as my, my wing person. And this is quite new, particularly at this 40th webinar in the series. So welcome to everyone to part two. Uh, which is uh, the second part focused on daily process management. And as you know, we have a recording from last week's session, which is available to you. Um, but I'm going to move on then in terms of the typical challenge. So Suze is particularly good at asking some great questions. That's, that's how I know Suze. And the question Suze has asked me for today's webinar is right up there with the best of them. So this is what I heard. The world of process management is blessed with an array of tools to support you but if you had to focus on the vital few and establish a minimum standard essential to enable everyday process management effectively, what would they be? That's what Sue said. Now, I'm not one to avoid a challenge, so let's go with that. But of course, there is always this sense that I love every tool like all of my children. I love each of them individually and dearly, and I wouldn't like to have to pick one out of the other. However, that's the challenge, and that's what I'm going to look to achieve today. Now, for those who were with me last week, I introduced Dave. Now, Dave is a middle manager in a middle, medium sized or, or, or organization, circa 150 reports. His business is part of a wider business system, but nonetheless, it's also a critical hub to other parts. Now, Dave, always in a hurry, always busy or very busy, one or other of those options he chose. Surprises and disappointment sadly characterized a typical day for him. Much of the day was either a surprise or disappointment in some way. Now, the process that he operated, the core process itself was actually easily identifiable. But what Dave would say to me is that you wouldn't think we all worked in the same business. Everyone seemed to think their process was core. It's the most important. So we had different priorities, agendas, speed essential direction opt optional but frankly no one plotted or deliberately worked against dave they just concentrated on getting their own house in order 
Now, I have to say it was a business where wherein there was a deep aversion to stepping out of the shadows to try something new. But everyone seemed to be chasing things. The last crisis overtaken by the latest one. The problems typically were dealt with often by some un unknown means, but there was a deep unease that the problem remained deep in the undergrowth, ready to spring out when Dave least expected it. And I'm sure we've all experienced that. So why would you want to bother making changes? Why not just deal with the problems and maintain the status quo? It's got to be a lot easier. But of course, change won't happen unless someone like Dave feels sufficiently discomfort with the current situation, the current state, and takes the initiative. So he or she can also appreciate the long-term positive implications, as I believe Dave did, even if he didn't know yet how to get there and actually what it, what it was that he was letting himself in for. So to affect change, we absolutely need the physical things, the tools to help enable the change. But as you're going to find out, hopefully over the next 45, 50 minutes, we also need principle and method. But for today's webinar, I'll focus specifically on answering Sue's question. Those tools, the vital few. And probably along the way, We'll hear some more things as well as that. So what I'll cover, the vital few tools of daily process management to establish a minimum standard. And from all of those myriad of hundreds and hundreds of tools that we experienced, that we've come across, we've seen, we've learned, we've read about, I'm going to select my top three. So in order to position this, let's just reflect on our own current practice and improvement. And what I'm interested in, so it's a personal reflection. So a lot of this is about you reflecting on your own experience as much as the responses we get. So it's an authentic response. So where are you now, not where you would like to be? And what I'm interested in then, if you would please, is reflect on your current practice in improvement and ask yourself this great, these questions. Do you consciously select your favorite tools, identify the method and then select the tool? You always integrate principle, method, and tools in everything you do. Or I just don't have a set approach. It depends. So on the screen, then, you'll see the poll. I'd like you to pick one of those four. So reflecting on your current experience in, in uh, improvement and practice, do you consciously, and which one of those best reflect your own experience? Thanks, Thank you. So Thanks, Sue. That's okay, so that polling is live and I can see you're all responding to that. Mm. Um, I've had a technical um, play around based on some feedback. People have said that there was some echoing. I can't hear myself twice now, which is definitely better. So I think I may have solved that. So Excellent. that's good news. <laughs> Excellent, good, good, good. You're coming across loud and clear to me, Sue, so. Good, good. 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 Okay, I'm just going to give that another 10 seconds. So mm -hmm. if you haven't yet cast your vote, if you'd like to do that. Okay, I'm going to close that now and then I'll share the results with you all. Mm -hmm. So we obviously, we have a, I don't have a set approach with 45% of people mm. uh, heading in that direction. Is that what you would have expected, Barry? Uh, at least. <laughs> okay. At, at least. I, 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 I absolutely, as I look, as I look at the results there, I would think that that's, that's a pretty accurate reflection of our experience. Um, and, and I suppose we would be advocating one of those four over the course of the next hour, but it's interesting to see authentically how people feel. Mm. And, and as a consequence, it's often that we don't have a set approach. And sometimes we, we identify an approach in the hope that it actually delivers the result. But unfortunately, hope is not a strategy. Yes. But nonetheless, it's useful data, and and I may well come back to play to, to to the numbers and play back on this. But um, no, thank you for that. that that's uh, no that's very interesting. Just let me know if you want to see them again. I can share them again. Okay, Thanks, appreciate Barry. that. Thanks, Sue. Cheers. No okay, so um, it it may well it may well be actually that the next statement you're about to see is one that's quite common and one that you may have experienced or seen. Um, any research I've done on this particular analogy, if you will, seems to have a number of authors. So it's like success of many fathers and fa failure has few. But if I call this Maslow's hammer, just read what Abraham Maslow says about this, these sort of topics. 
To the man or person who only has a hammer, everything he encounters begins to look like a nail. Now, of course, Mazza would have said, I suppose it is tempting if the only tool you have is a hammer to treat everything as if it were a nail. Now, what's interesting about this statement, of course, is, is it can be a throwaway remark, but it says something deeper about our approach and our thinking or absence of thinking. So Maslow's hammer analogy, if you will, it's, all, it's inferring a, a, a recognized bias that's essentially involving an over-reliance on the familiar tool. And sometimes that is the trap we fall into. Of the myriad of tools we have available, we go to our, the, our trusted friends, that small, the handful of tools. And as a consequence of that, a hammer, in many cases, is not the most appropriate tool for every purpose. Yet someone with just a hammer is likely to try and fix everything using the hammer without conscious thought that there actually might be other options. So I want, to con I want you to consider that, that, that there is a much wider, wider vista in which we want to operate in. We often prefer to make do with what we have rather than looking for better alternatives. And that just goes for more than just the tools themselves. It goes for a, a lot of our approaches. And perhaps that's where Dave may have fallen into. He was, dis he was, he was comfortable in his discomfort so he may do with what he had rather than necessarily looking for better alternatives. So the journey that I'm taking Dave on will actually be this process of looking for better alternatives. And for you, the potential that there are better alternatives in terms of how we select those tools. Of course, the problem then is that the unconscious bias that we have often hampers our thinking. And it's because of that and because that's one of the factors that prevents improvement programs delivering their intent. So we have to integrate the right tools with the right method underpinned by principle. Tools, on, uh, tools alone will not give you the result that you're looking for. So thinking, method, and tools. Now, our work in PMI as you will probably all be aware, is firmly grounded in Edward Deming's system of profound knowledge. This hasn't been developed overnight. 60, 70, 80 years reflection and experience and practice. It underpins all of our work, where, irrespective of where we're working, both internally and with clients when we're client facing. But for today, for this webinar, I'd like you to accept that the system of profound knowledge is the guiding principle on which we deploy method and tools. So I'm going to set that, set that aside and on the assumption that we appreciate that the system of profound knowledge is embedded in everything we do. And therefore, we'll then move forward in order to understand the method and then subsequently the tools themselves. So all tools and approaches are based on a set of principles, SOPK. The approach and tools we select are based on what it is that we are trying to accomplish. So there is the first clue. The approach and tools we select are based on what it is that we are trying to accomplish. And I suppose a rhetorical question to you is how often do we ask this, the first question of the three question model, what is it that we're trying to accomplish? So over the last 100 or even many more years than that, we've developed, adapted, adopted methods and tools to help us with our improvement processes. That's just how, that's just how life has been. We have evolved. But it, curiously, the tools were, were put in our hands, but at no point did actually claim that, no one actually claimed that the tools were magic and certainly not in themselves in isolation. And, and Suze was telling me an interesting story this morning, which I won't necessarily share, Suze, but I was interesting in terms of the gift you had of a tool set. It was put in your hands, but actually it didn't achieve the magic. So it's not my intention to work through the construct or actually the detailed use um, of either the method or tools as we've covered them elsewhere. And should you wish to know more, please, please uh, reach out and, and know that we can support you with that. However, what I want to do is I want to provide context within which a small number of the vital few tools, as Suze calls them, that may be illustrated. The vital few, the minimum required to enable everyday process management, and specifically the ones that help Dave get control. 
Now, when thinking about the methods and tools, though, it's important to keep a perspective on the improvement initiative. And this is something that we, you know, regularly we have to advise clients is not to lose sight of what it is you're trying to accomplish. So it's important to keep a perspective on the improvement initiative. The objective must always be to make an improvement and not to use the tools. If you can achieve an improvement without using the tools, obviously we'd encourage you then to keep focus on making the improvements. So why do tools and methods exist? Well, they do that to lend insight into whenever questions arise, when we're interested in what are the next steps and when they're not obvious, or potential solutions when they're not available. But the tools themselves only represent one aspect of the broader improvement philosophy. And for example, as you can see there, the three question, the model for improvement, it, it is strictly a method to organize and manage the thinking and improvement project. So as a method, that's what we would recognize is its ambition. The tools that would underpin that will then may well be a charter for a case in point in order to answer the first question, run charts, to display, to display measures or control charts, which would be the response to the second question, how do we know change and improvement? And check sheets in order to collect data, flow charts to understand how the work works and so on, which would classify as what are the changes that we would consider making. Now, irrespective of the approach that we take, any approach to improvement broadly follows the principles I've just described, and they are supported by the requirement to understand customer value and that standardization comes before an improvement. So I will set that and draw a line under, under that. So in Dave's world then, and Dave's world as it was, old habits died hard. The, I've described the dynamic within which he found himself and he often described it as, as chaotic. And it was interesting and intriguing from the first webinar from last Friday, where the results of the poll suggested that his story resonated with many of you. And essentially what I was seeing when I reviewed the data later on is that many of our organizations apparently will be able to establish a strategy and in many cases are able to cascade that down into the system. So essentially what we see is our CEO, board members, heads of functions and so forth. Typically, we would expect them to be working on the system. And as a consequence of that, the strategic ambition, the goals, the targets, the objectives would be cascaded down through the middle and lower ranks in the organization, the hierarchical uh, 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 dis uh, dissemination. And that's what the expectation would be. But the, to the poll results themselves indicated something that Dave found. And that is whilst there may have been a strategy and it may have been cascaded, the reality of course of his system is that the interdependencies and the relationships and the working habits and styles within Dave's business were not nurtured, they weren't cared for. And as a consequence, there were multiple agendas. And in addition to that, the performance results seen every day didn't automatically then feed back up to the system. So that was interesting and intriguing from the poll results, which tended to support that Dave himself wasn't alone. But Dave was frequently surprised and even more frequently disappointed, let down, because the other parts of the system were working on their own chaos, doing their best to resolve their problems. And there's no doubt that the dynamic that he was experiencing extended higher up into the system. So at that particular time, I think it was fair to say that the sense was that everyone was working in the system, resolving the latest crisis. So it was in that context, therefore, that we then had to understand what exactly was the scenario that Dave was facing. So what is the problem that he's experiencing in order for us to be able to, 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 to make progress? Now, I also described last week and uh, 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 the, 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 the sense of despair, if you will, when Dave um, uh, was taken through this particular slide. What he quickly learned was that processes, when they are left unattended, they decay into entropy, a state of chaos. And that's the very place he found himself in. But he knew that the work got done, 
He didn't know by what means necessarily, and nor was he actually absolutely clear about at what cost. So when things inevitably did go wrong, what was unclear was the values, the principles, the methods, and the tools that he could call upon were just not clear to him. So he could see that his business was a symptom of something more uh, endemic and the dawning realization that it was the heroics of him and his people that delivered the outcomes they achieved. Okay. And so we worked on an approach. And that approach is daily process management, everyday, everyday process management, in order to move Dave from chaos to stability and ultimately improvement and sustainability. Now you might just want to reflect on the words that Deming used in terms of the best intentions. And often the best intentions of our people, the best efforts of our people in that sense can actually make the problem worse in his case with the way of being ruined by the best efforts put forward. So in terms of the specific tools themselves, again, it's useful to put this into context. Now, I'm sure like you, uh, like me, you've, you've probably heard the statement, we are where we are. And I often get a sense of that that's a, it's a sort of a dismissive, it's a worryingly dismissive refrain. It's almost like, let's not go there. From this point on, let's move forward. And I have to say that sometimes it does irk me because clearly ignoring the lessons of the past are only likely to ensure that we repeat them. So what Dave needed was context, to look at the challenges in context, gathering extra data or information. So these are important words. He had to look at the challenge in context, gathering extra data or information so that he could understand the broader picture and not draw conclusions about a factor situation in isolation. He had a view, he had a view about how his system was set up, and he also had a view about the ability or inability of, of individual functions to collaborate together in terms of improving the, the, the situation that they found themselves in. So he, had, he essentially had two choices. He could either work very hard to overcome resistance, and clearly that may well drive the problem even, even uh, uh, worse, um, or he could look to increase the readiness to change. And of course, then in terms of setting the context for him, the GIV model then comes into its own. So the GIV model helped Dave and others, other functions reporting into Dave, helped them change how they thought about the work. The three components that are present in every project or program is the, the what is done, how is it organized, and what might be going on in people's minds, the feelings, the emotions. Now the tools themselves, the, the what we do, they predate us all. And they've been, you know, they've been deployed very successfully over, over many years. So that is not in question. How the work is organized, uh, how we do it, the middle section of what we call the hamburger model, is also sufficiently robust. But it is very wrong to think that just both of them together are sufficient to lead to success. So critically in our experience over many years, it tells us that programs, projects, initiatives, call them what you will, most often fail as a consequence of a failure to attend to the social, emotional, and political reality that dominate in many organizations. How we feel, our place in the system, my sense of self-esteem, my own ability to cope. So tools alone will not work if we are to achieve a successful outcome, but they certainly will help. So with some insight into Dave's situation, what method helped him establish the minimum requirements to get control? Uh, to stabilize, which vital few tools did he deploy and how did he deploy them? So once again, a high level graphic illustration of the methodology then is our approach called standardize, maintain and improve, SMI. So this is our approach in order to enable that fundamental everyday process management, establishing a culture of, of managing by process. Um, and as you can see, the various components that make up SMI um, are underpinned by a series of tools. So, for example, in terms of standardizing the process, we flowchart the process. 
We understand customers, organize the workspace, document the standard and mistake proof and, and so forth. In terms of maintaining the, the process, we clearly establish measures. We craft control charts. We monitor those control charts and interpret, and we maintain the standard. Whilst in continuing improvement, the incremental improvement, we're looking at the prevention, problem solving, the prevention uh, uh, of, of problems reoccurring, waste elimination, and clearly working on variation and so forth. So you can see here from this graphic that essentially this is the methodology and the chronology that typically we would deploy. And some of you may already have experienced that in, in our consulting with you. And just once again to remind you then that all approaches, irrespective of whether they're SMI or TPM or TQM or the FSS, all approaches to improvement broadly follow the principle that we need to understand customer value and that standardization comes before improvement. So I've said that twice, really as a grounding, as an, as an anchor. Okay. So with that in mind, and recognizing that the challenge from Sue's, of course, is, is of all of that and recognizing the context we're working in, what are the vital few tools that will enable, at, at the very least, the opportunity to stabilize and standardize, and then fundamentally begin to embed this mindset of everyday process management. So in order to help us, let me just pose a second question. Now, this question is one of those sort of topics, and, and, and I appreciate um, some, of, some of our listeners may not necessarily have the benefit of listening to some of our BBC radio programmes here. And there is one specifically where guests are invited to identify, if they were stranded on a desert island, what one book, what, what one song, and what one item would you want to have with you on this island? And essentially, I'm looking to do the same thing here. So I have been asked in the past, this is true, if I was stranded on a desert island, what are the small number of improvement tools that I would wish to have with me? Because I can't have them all. Now, for the purposes of this exercise, I, I think we should, we'll just have to imagine that there is an imperative to know the answer. But pressing you for the relative importance and impact which of these eight tools would you wish to have alongside you? Now, we don't have the luxury of a desert island, but what we do have is we do have an environment that in many cases is very much like Dave's. And therefore, if you were looking into Dave's situation, the dynamic that surrounded him, which of these tools, recognizing the relative's importance and impact, would you wish to have alongside you were you to go to work with him? So in the context of SMI, and you've just seen this before, what would your top three choices of tools be? And we'd like you to select three. So answers one to eight from that list, please, if you would, and I can see your answer. Great. Yes, that's great. Thanks, Barry. The, the, the polling is launched. I can see that mm. people are voting. That's fantastic. Do please keep, you, as, as Barry said, you can have three choices. Mm. Uh, we're generous here. We don't, you know, we don't limit you to just the one. <laughs> <laughs> that, that goes into the same as listening to you twice, then, Suze, I take it. That's <laughs> okay, so interesting. Okay, good. good. I, love the, I, I love the thought, Barry. It doesn't surprise me that you'd want to take some of these things with you on a desert island. I always thought that... Uh, <laughs> You know, you're 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 a process man through and through. <laughs> I, I I think we do live live a lot for outside uh, outside sometimes. <laughs> okay, last few seconds. If I can just ask you, if you haven't yet voted, if you could just mm. pick your options, mm. and then I will share the results with everybody. Mm. There we go. Hmm. 71% standard operating procedure. Excellent. Okay, so standard operating procedure is the highest, followed by control charts, mm -hmm. followed by cause and effect. Excellent. Okay, and then the scatter diagram, Pareto and run chart and, and, and histogram and so on are, are further down. I, of course, there is, this, there is this typical consultant's response, it depends, <laughs> naturally. <laughs> 
but I think it's useful in the context of dive and in the con in the context of the SMI cycle that if I'm given three choices, um, I would be quite quite tactical in how I used used those. Mm. Yeah. So as a consequence of that, um, I I will be now exposing what I believe would be the three that would be sitting alongside me whilst I read my book with my son Tanar. Yeah, and uh, therefore the you know the the uh, their attendees might want to consider where this might fit. And I would like to give some justification as to why it is that I've selected those. So and here they are. So in terms of the response that the, the response I would give to Suze, my immediate thought would be to begin to understand something about the current situation. So I'm collecting data, I'm looking to study the current situation. In order for me then to make sense of that current situation, I would need to be able to interpret in some way the data that I'd collected, both, both, uh, both uh, qualitative and quantitative. And then in order for me to be able to do something about it, my sense was a cause and effect diagram would be useful. Now, I've no doubt that where we all sitting together in the same room, we would have some very useful and insightful conversations. So I'm, I'm not for one minute suggesting, forget everything you know and just follow what Baz had said, but I'd like to give you some justification as to why I would, I would select it. Why did I select these tools? So flow charting. In every other organization, there's an obligation on every part of the system, everyone who works in that system to contribute its best to that system and not to maximize its own contribution or situation or standing. If we were to do that, we would classically then fall into the trap of suboptimal, suboptimization. And it is counter, and it was counter, to Dave's ambition to get control, to make his work work. If we are operating suboptimally, it would be extremely difficult, if not impossible, for Dave to establish the flow, the control that he was looking to do. But what he did know he needed to do, he knew he had to engage others in order to build this readiness for change because the change was happening. But as a consequence of that, he also recognized from his insights into the, into the, uh, the GID model that he would need to build uh, allegiances and collaborate. So engagement was critical. So what did that mean in practical terms? Well, it meant that he needed to understand the context within which the work was being done. But not just him, the other functional part of the system, so that everyone could appreciate the context and enabling a much more, I'll use the word, a much more mature, coherent, cohesive, shared view of the very thing that inextricably linked them all together, which was the core processes that delivered the outcome that the customer was looking for. So he knew the work didn't work, that didn't flow. He knew there was a genuine and significant discomfort across his business, that the various interfaces were less than optimal. Indeed, you know, everyone talked to him and talked to me, by the way, about them being in silos. So we gathered the key players together, as you would expect. And in advance of that, Dave had actually crafted the three question model for the workshop. So what was his ambition? What would success look like for today? And the agenda that he proposed which which the reality is of course it's a theory he had a theory of an agenda that would deliver his ambition the flow chart that was jointly created gave a visual picture of the process of interest now we know that there are several types of flow charts and i don't intend to go through that but typically an integrated flow chart is really useful in order to understand the wider system context within which the process sits so the flowchart crafted alongside the three question model actually helped Dave and the team define the scope of the work. It served also as the potential as a data collection form. In other words, from the flowchart, we were able to determine what are the key things we need to know about this process and therefore what measures will help us understand process performance and therefore potential targets. And the third thing the, the flowchart uh, enabled him to do was to, going back, was to identify 
the immediate obvious improvements that Dave and his team could make. So for the first time, the process of flow charting helped Dave and his team share a common view of the work, how it worked, and critically, a shared view of the bigger change that they faced. But like many of the organizations we experienced, his operation was a data factory. There was lots of data. He was drowning in data, but actually the data was for someone, for some purpose, often far removed from the system and processes that were right in front of him and his team. But he soon learned that through the flowcharting workshop, acquiring more appropriate and useful data was just the first part of the challenge. So just getting the data in itself was only part of the challenge. What he had to do was develop the capability to interpret that data and do that appropriately and respond to it in the most optimal, efficient and effective way. So we analyze numbers in order to know when a change has occurred in the process. That's, that's what we do now. We also want to know as soon as that change has happened so that we can respond appropriately. But the numbers change in every process. Everything varies. But even when the process itself doesn't change, the numbers change. And essentially we call that noise. So there's routine variation, it's run of the mill, it's expected. We would just expect this process to operate within these limits. Other variation isn't routine though, it's exceptional. Right? And it's a signal of a process change. So a change in process behavior is very likely to inform us about something significant. And we should see that as an opportunity. Now, I think it's interesting that we call control charts, obviously control charts, but they control nothing. And perhaps they're better described as a process behavior chart. So essentially we use the control charts in order to understand how the processes themselves were behaving. So we needed to be able to distinguish between the noise and the changes in Dave's business that were significant. Hence why we use the control chart to distinguish between the two types of variation, as we know, both common cause, an assignable cause. So there are other things, of course, that we know are useful and that can move our thinking on considerably when we're using control charts. For example, what's it like being a customer of a process where there is significant variation and, and potential signals? You know, is the performance of Dave's process reasonably predictable? Could he plan his resource for three, six, nine, twelve months? Do the people in and around him know how to interpret the data and also respond appropriately to the type of data he sees? And finally, and importantly, does the culture of his leadership team in and around him, do they recognize and adapt to variation in our people or do, do we just blame them? So what the control chart and the flow chart enabled Dave to do at this point was to move away from the cultural challenge of responding to and explaining away the noise. And I have to say, I recall that they were extremely good and extremely convincing at explaining away things and looking more on focusing on the signals themselves. Something significant has happened in the process and it is worthy of investigation. If there's any corruption to this approach, for example, treating the noise as significant and treating the significant signals as noise is classic tampering, which serves only to make the problem worse. So please think about collecting data is just one of the three elements that are important in terms of uh, uh, improvement. Collect the appropriate data, interpret the data and respond to it. Three very different skill sets. And I think what's interesting about this is if you look at the bigger system view, the fundamental capability of any business to transform is because it can collect the right data, it can interpret the data it has, and it can respond appropriately to that. Now, the final one was the cause and effect diagram. The control charts that we used, they actually opened Dave's eyes to this new world and actually to the dangers of data too. And one of the things that stuck, struck him most notably was the futility of averaging any, anything. So he appreciated that when a process displays significant variation, 
he needed to identify designable cars. In other words, he needed to investigate and also eliminate its effect on this process. Now, because, he all, because there was a signal there um, and that it was affecting the process, there was a suggestion then that perhaps they weren't sufficiently close enough. So somehow they had overlooked as a consequence of not being able to visualize them. Now, investigating and eliminating assignable causes will make sure the process operates more consistently, more predictably and reliable and more reliably. But the flow chart and the control chart together, the trio then should be made up with the cause and effect diagram. So cause and effect, Ishikawa, CDAC, Fishbone, various descriptions used. We use that and we use this to collect and organize knowledge about potential causes of the problems and variation that Dave was experiencing. So this is the, the interpretation, but the response is now coming to bear. The cause and effect diagram is very useful in PDSA for those who are practicing PDSI cycle. But one of the challenges here is to be mindful that cause and consequential effect that could be separated in time and space so that a change that's made today at, in somewhere in the system may not manifest itself until much later, much, much later in, in time. And I'm saying that because we had more than one occasion when that was the case. A change was made in one function that it took many months for it to filter through. And as a consequence of the consequences and the sequences were hidden from normal view and therefore Dave and his team couldn't describe them. So our guidance would be then in this particular case is if you can, if you see variation, continue to ask the question, why does it vary? Why does it vary? And what are our theories? So again, these are the sort of written in the DNA today, asking those sort of questions. So explaining cause and effect is a good start. Learning lies in being able to explain a cause and effect, forming theories and making predictions so that we can test. So it's PDSA in play. So the flow chart and the control chart and the cause and effect itself. Because of this initial work, Dave and his team did gain control. They standardized the critical parts of the key processes. And they were also able to embed, identify and embed a small number of insightful measures in order to understand performance and detect abnormality. So that was now the norm. Incremental improvement, now this is not radical step change improvement, but incremental improvement came from the immediate, the obvious improvements that they were, that was well within the team's capability. And that is often the case. That's often the case. A lot of the this incremental improvements that we see may actually be well within the team's capability to resolve themselves. And through the application of, of more rigorous and disciplined problem solving methodologies, opportunities arose in order to mistake proof some elements so that we didn't have problems reoccurring. So in time, and with the continued attention to monitoring and responding to variation, Dave was then in a position where he had sufficient insight into the everyday work that he saw around him. He actually called it, we know where we are, to confidently inquire of his directors. And he was asking them the question, so we know where we are. Can you please tell me where we are going? What direction should I take? What direction should I head? There were conversations that would never have taken place just a matter of a, short, a few short months before. Now, the reality for the directors, of course, and for Dave, is that objectives and target setting became so much less traumatic and where strategic targets were stretched, what Dave was able to do was to commission green or black belts to work alongside him and his team on, in some of the areas that required a more radical process redesign activities, the, 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 the heavy improvements that we appreciate. But I suppose if you can imagine being a green belt or a black belt that was commissioned by Dave and his team, how fertile would that dynamic, how far fertile would that culture be in order for you to be successful? And this was our experience. So a final reminder then that what Dave was able to do was to work in the system, 
understand how the work works, monitor process performance and respond to abnormality, define and redefine how the process should work, so standard operating procedures and so forth. His operators were more than capable of operating and monitoring the processes themselves to be able to respond to abnormalities appropriately. So they knew where, what the important things were and they, were also, they also understood the process in order to, to deal with abnormality. And the final element of course was it's that they had an opportunity to work on their own processes, not just to run the process, but also to improve the process. And for the senior leadership, of course, this essentially is a gift. So they now have data coming back from the system data that has some validity it also then enables them to understand and to be more rational and reasonable about those objectives and, and target setting and in fact the ambitions of the business could be stretched further because of the capability that was embedded in this organization through david and his team barry before you go yes, on to yes. your summary can i just mm. we've got a, a question um from paul mm. and his question is uh, how do you differentiate from correlation? No, I'm going to say this again. How do you differentiate correlation from causation? Hmm. I, 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 I mean, I'm intrigued in why this question has arisen, but without context, I think I'll answer it as it is. Um, I, I, correlation, and I, I, I recall often having to having to coach delegates and and, and clients on on this particular topic because. You know, correlation, we can find correlation in lots of things. We can find correlation in lots of things. And I mean, the typical one that we refer to is the is ice cream sales and, and, and shark attacks. We see, we see this often presented as a classic example of correlation, but is it causal correlation? <laughs> and, and I suppose this then becomes the key element within, the, within, the, within scatter. So looking at, looking at our cause and effect, it's coming back to cause and effect, of course, again. Mm. is the requirement to, to, to assess from the trivial many, and it's an expression that we use, from the trivial many that we often um, uh, 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 identify when we're generating cause and effect diagrams, is how do we funnel down from that trivial dozens and hundreds? How do we get down to these vital few? Okay, now, um, the beauty of process management and process thinking is when you know your process well, being able to differentiate between causal correlation and correlation becomes significantly easier. Hmm. Um, in advance of even assessing cause and effect, very often we can predict. And as a consequence of that, it becomes extremely easy. We know how the work works. We know the, the levers that we pull in order to see effects. And as we get better and better at understanding how this work works, we're able to identify and eliminate the causes of abnormality. It's a topic that in context, I would probably be able to respond to much more practically, Suze. Yes, I know, I but understand. I, but, but, I, but I, I think it's a great question. If that question is stimulated by someone's unease that you, you can confuse the two, I'm, I think that's very worthy. <laughs> Perhaps <laughs> we'll have a conversation another time. Okay, thanks, Barry. Right. And thanks, Paul. And get in touch thanks, if Paul. you want to know more. Yes, yeah, sure, absolutely. Okay, so in, in, in summary then, uh, this, the, the key points. Uh, that tools, tools on their own, won't enable the success that we're looking to achieve. Principle, method, and tools. Establishing context helps others see. Hence why the flow chart, if someone had said, well, of the three, which one of those three alone would you take? And it would be the flow chart. Because a flowchart as a tool is very different from flowcharting as a process. So flowcharting as a process opens up a world of insight and opportunity. So the process of deploying a tool itself is a method. 
but please be prepared to abandon the tool if it doesn't work just constantly hammering that nail in the hope that it gives you an answer it's done its magic step back and think there may be an alternative proposition here what me which which mental model do we need to apply and finally if we look across the broad range of approaches that we see and there are many approaches irrespective of which one you select standardization monitoring of the processes the everyday processes and incrementally improving those processes should be the underpinning approach for all of that so imagine in your organization where as you know everyone works in the process there is no one in anyone's organization who does not work in the process and we often don't coach people in process thinking and process management imagine having a culture where that was sufficiently fertile like Dave's is now in order then to embed more more sustained more radical step change improvement becomes so much easier Susan Thanks, Barry. Um, so uh, before we close the session, um, a couple of things just to let you um, know about and to remind you. Um, we have now launched our all new version of our certified Lean Six Sigma online Yellow Belt course. So, you know, if you or any members of your team are looking for an instruction in improvement, it's a great place to start. You can find all the details on our website. Also, we are continuing our offer of providing a complimentary Apple iPad. This is to equip you for a really great virtual experience when you enroll on our public Lean Six Sigma Green Belt or Black Belt or Master Black Belt courses. And if you want to know anything about these courses, we've got a number of customer voice to customer videos on social media. So please do have a look at those where they talk about their experience of attending our recent virtual classroom courses. Finally, do look out for our voice to customer survey. You'll receive that shortly from us. And as I said at the beginning, we're really, really grateful for your feedback. We do look at the topics as well that you suggest and plan those into our future webinars. So that brings us to the end of today's session. So on behalf of PMI, Barry and myself, I'd like to thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Barry, for your time today. You're welcome. And I wish everybody a very safe and relaxing weekend. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, take care.